Good morning. Uh, you know that she's the uh, parent of adult kids and that this was her first interaction with Baby Shark uh, song. It may have, you know, it may have already occurred in my life that at sort of 6.30 a.m. it was, Alexa, play Baby Shark in the kitchen. And so this was my second version of the Baby Shark song uh, this morning. My, my five-year-old loves that song, so I, I probably have a high-quality pre-K experience to thank for that. Um, but I'm glad to be here and sing Baby Shark for the second time, um, but more specifically to talk with you about our work to kind of collaborate with communities across the Commonwealth to prepare more Virginia children for kindergarten. We go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, as we've been across the Commonwealth talking with folks, uh, families, providers, superintendents, principals, teachers, what we wanted to do first is understand what are the challenges, right? As the First Lady talked about, as you see in your brochure today, we increasingly understand as a society how important early childhood is, right? We understand how much of the brain development occurs. We understand that kids are developing those critical academic skills as well as those social emotional skills. So as you watch that group come onto the stage, that ability to keep their hands to themselves, that ability to persist at a task, pay attention, can be as important as some of those key understanding those letters and numbers. Um, and yet there are still some real challenges. We don't prepare all kids for kindergarten in Virginia. And a lot of that has to do with the set of experiences they have prior to kindergarten. So what we know and what we believe to be true is that all Virginia children are capable of entering kindergarten ready, right? Coming to school with those key literacy, numeracy, and social emotional and self-regulation skills needed to be successful in a kindergarten classroom. If you go out there and ask a kindergarten teacher, they'll likely say, the hardest challenge is not the letter sounds or counting to 10 or 20. The biggest challenge is for the kids that don't have the capacity to be successful in our classroom. And right now, we know that only 60% of our kids are entering fully ready um, with all of those sets of skills. And we know that the kids who are not entering ready are already starting behind and are less likely to be successful, less likely to enter the third grade up level, less likely to go on to, to graduate on time, to be successful in college or post-secondary. And there are a couple of reasons for this when you think about this more broadly, not just in terms of Allegheny Highlands, but kind of more broadly across the state. First of all, a lot of our kids do not have access to high quality care and education. So upwards of 70% of kids that might be eligible, this is not just four-year-olds like we saw today, but across the whole birth to five spectrum, infants, toddlers, three-year-olds, and four-year-olds, have access to something that's affordable. I'll give you two important statistics to think about. Right now, we know that for Virginia kids under the age of six, two-thirds of them have all available parents in the workforce two-thirds of them, right, of the 100,000 kids that are born in Virginia to give here have all available parents in the workforce. So they're somewhere, right? They're being served by someone, whether it's friends, informal care, schlepping back and forth, mom and dad, or just mom, or just dad, trying to figure out schedules, but they're getting some form of early childhood experience. Now, whether that's high quality care and education, that's another thing. So you've got all of these kids out there that need some form of care and education, and yet you've got child care and early childhood education that's really expensive. In fact, right now, in about half the states in our country, the cost of infant care is more than in-state tuition. The cost of infant care is more than in-state tuition. So although you've got scholarships and Pell Grants and FAFSA all of those things to help subsidize tuition, right, for college, you hear a lot of talk about that and for making college more affordable, infant care is more expensive than that. And there's very few resources beyond the federal block grant, beyond the child care subsidy program to help parents afford that. So what that means is a lot of folks are scrambling and a lot of kids, particularly our birth to three kids, are not getting experiences that are high quality. For those that are lucky enough, those 30% of the eligible kids that do get a slot at high quality childcare, at Head Start, or at Pre-K, 
we don't even know what we're getting in terms of their experience. The first lady talked about you know, how these teacher-child interactions matter, like what kids are experiencing today. And it doesn't matter the name on the outside of the building, the funding source. What matters is what those teachers and called teachers, not workers or babysitters, what they're doing with kids day in, day out. And yet we don't, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, have a consistent way of evaluating those. We don't say, this is, you know, this is clearly what we want to see in all programs. So in some child care programs, they're more focused on sort of steps to diapering and this thing. And this pre-K program, they might be focused on curriculum. And that pre-K program, they might be focused on something totally different. We don't have a consistent measure of success and a way of measuring it across those programs. So we don't even know what we're getting with the half billion dollars we spend in the Commonwealth each year on our publicly funded programs. From the provider perspective, you can understand why this happens. If you're a child care provider, an elementary school principal, you're running a Head Start, you have on a daily basis to navigate a maze. The easiest part, it might seem hard to get all of those kids up on the stage and get them dancing, but that's way easier than it is navigating the 170 pages of you know, standards for this, the licensing regulations for that, the expectations for this, the teacher licensure for that. You have to navigate this maze, meaning you're focusing on everything except for what matters most, those teacher-child interactions. So it's really, really difficult to kind of focus on quality when there's a million other things and hoops that you're jumping through. And finally, why not all our kids are doing kindergarten ready? So we also know in the Commonwealth that we're a state of sort of great opportunity, but also great disparity. And so if you look at some of the increasing trends in our state, right, we've got sort of more kids in poverty, particularly coming out of the recession, right? And some real challenges facing those families. We're identifying more kids with special needs or higher rates of autism and other concerns. And we've got more dual language learners, right? So you've got families that are coming into the state, which is exciting, right? New families, new excitement, sort of driving our economy with incredibly low unemployment rates, but they sometimes can be sort of more challenging to serve. Finding those families, getting them connected to our early childhood programs and supporting them so they enter kindergarten ready and have every opportunity for success over the course of their educational career. you a sense as the Commonwealth kind of by the numbers. And sometimes it can be hard to know, well, what are we talking about? What does this look like? But I think it's important to think about this. So if you take roughly each year in Virginia, about 100,000 kids are born. So if you were to that down to kind of an easier number to, to wrap your head around 100, this gives you a sense of the kind of the demographics. And I, my, my guess is in some of our rural counties, it's even more challenging. But roughly each year, 100 kids are born, right? Of them, 14 are born into families in poverty, and even twice as sort of much, 26 more, are born into families just above there, right? So we, the poverty levels look better than some other states, but you look at those families just above there, right? Just inching behind that working poor, there's quite a large percentage of families. You'll see of all those families, right? So above those 100 kids, sort of, let's say, you know, close to 30%, would be eligible. Only 10 will benefit from home visiting, um, which is a really important program where you connect with moms and with families prenatally and support them through those first difficult months. Only one of those children will get an early Head Start slot, right? So one of the highest quality infant and toddler services, only one in 100 will get that. We know that only eight will get the Head Start slot, and then about 22 or so will get sort of access to high quality pre-K. So we're doing a much better job for those four-year-olds but again, you know, what about birth to three and all of the experiences that get those kids to four? Um, we know that, as I said before, 67 of those children have all pa available parents in the workforce, yet only one will access child care subsidy as an infant. So think about that, right? One in 100 accessing infant subsidy and that cost of infant tuition being more than in-state tuition, right? So they already you've got such a stark disparity for our littlest learners four as toddlers and five as preschoolers. So we've really got a lot of families that are either sort of scrambling for care, turning down job opportunities because of child care reasons, or having to rely on informal care, right? So you call a neighbor this day, you get your mom to watch them that day, you find an aunt, right, which is sort of very stressful for the kids, doesn't provide the routines, the supports, the learning and those social supports that are so needed for kids to go on successful. We know that, um, and only one of those six kids receiving subsidy do we even know about the quality, 
the rest of them, it's hard to know. When I moved from Louisiana to Virginia, I wanted to find an option for my three-year-old and one-year-old, and it's very hard. There's very few quality programs that I know of, and then what do you do? What do you, how do you find out about the quality of a program if there's not one place you can go to understand that? You've got to navigate it as a, as a parent. We know that only one English language learner will be counted in pre-K, and yet we've got huge numbers as first graders. So what's <coughs> happening with all of our, our kids who are dual language learners? And then we also know that if, when it comes to helping our kids with sort of special needs, early intervention can make a huge difference in their lives. And yet the age in Virginia, which we identify the most kids for special services, for special education, is at the ninth grade. Um, and so we, we've kind of got it reversed, right? We need to be really working sort of in our early years to identify kids who are sort of developing atypically and figure out how you put all of these resources to get those kids, support them, and then put them on track for success. As a result, when you think about that now, and go back to that statistic I originally presented, it makes sense why only 60 of our 100 kids in a given year are entering kindergarten fully prepared for success. Here's another uh, way of thinking about kind of why it's so hard to provide um, high quality child care or why it's so hard as a parent to find high child, uh, quality child care. Oftentimes they use that adage of your system is perfectly designed to produce what it does, right? And right now, we call this the hot mess slide, but right now our system, which has kind of grown up organically, right, our early childhood system over the past three decades, starting with Head Start, right, with the sort of the more professionalization child care industry, kind of this recognition in our school systems and the importance of pre-K, but it all sort of grew up separately, right? Separate organizations, separate oversight at the federal and state levels, different ways of funding it, different acronyms, right? So then as somebody who was relatively new to this sector seven years ago, I walked in and I was like, there are a lot of alphabet letters, right? And it seems really complicated, but isn't a three-year-old a three-year-old, right? Does it really matter the name on the outside of the building of a funding source? Don't we want the same things for three-year-olds, regardless of the setting, whether it's a family day home, a child care home, a, you know, a Head Start program in a community center or a classroom in a school? Don't we want a set of learning experiences that puts that kid on track for success? Does it really matter? Um, and it probably doesn't matter, right? And so as a, I think as a society, as we realize how important early childhood is, part of our challenge is solving for the hot mess and trying to figure out how do we move away from kind of like we're identifying kids by funding source, right? If you actually talk to kind of a school administrator, that's often how we end up having to do it, to actually saying what are the, we start at the classroom level. We start with our teachers and what we want our teachers to do with kids. And then working from there, design the system to support the classroom, to support the families, to support the site leaders. Right? And that's how Richmond is organized. That's how our divisions are organized, rather than the hot mess that you see uh, behind you right now. And that kind of speaks to where we're going um, and why there's been such, there's such an emphasis under this administration on early childhood care and education. So this is another kind of compelling slide. We often use this slide um, with some of our, our business members. And I heard as we talked about kind of our elected officials in the audience today, we're ex extremely grateful for you giving up this time on this morning. This is not just a parent issue. This is not just a school division issue, right? This is not a community issue. This is a business issue. The workforce of today needs high quality child care and education, right? Because if otherwise, how are you going to have parents that can work and sort of be at work, right? Not just have a job, but be there five days a week, whatever their schedule is. If you don't have high quality child care, it's really hard to come to work in time and pay attention to your work. And for the workforce of tomorrow. You know, when they talk about kind of the new profile of a graduate, which it sounds like was one of your prior uh, sort of summit topics, you know, that ability to think critically, to be curious, to take on new challenges, you're not going to have. The kids today that we saw are not going to have just one career, right? They're going to have multiple careers. They're needing to be learners over the course of their adult lives. And preparing them for that starts now, right? Helping them kind of think creatively, helping them problem solve, develop those skills that are very applicable when, when their brains are plastic and malleable is so important. And in fact, it's not only important morally, but economically, as this chart shows, you get the biggest return on your investment. So you think about those numbers I just talked about, those prenatal programs, those home visiting programs that right now only benefit one in 10, right, you know, of, uh, of our Virginia families, 
you get the biggest bang for your buck on. You sort of save money, kids are born on time, they have sort of less health issues immediately than over the course of their lives. You then get your kind of programs targeted towards birth to three, and your pre-K programs have far more return than kind of schooling, job training, and any sort of post-secondary kind of workforce interventions. Now, I'm not saying we should reduce funding at all for K-12. I know in our, in our other lives that we often talk about the importance of education overall as investment. But it's crazy when you think about how much we spend again on college, how much we spend on kind of K-12, and yet in terms of potentially the biggest bang for our buck as a society is in those early years. And if you go back to what I talked about before, right, only one in 100 infants in Virginia gets access to child care subsidy. One in 100, right? And yet we know if we could get that child in those earliest years into a high quality program, you can have you know, a 13% return on investment. So this is compelling, you're right? You're like, you're ready to do it? You're ready to sign up and go? So where do we go from here? So working with this administration, working with our elected officials, the General Assembly, and most importantly, working with you also, working with superintendents, working with YMCA, working with Smarter Beginnings, working with our kind of partners across the state, including I think our next speakers from the University of Virginia, we are focused on figuring out how do we in the course of a few years, a few short years, make sure more Virginia children are entering kindergarten ready. This will require thinking differently about our system, both in Richmond and in communities across the state, but really moving away from kind of a funding-based or program-based identity to unifying our system, um, you know, potentially bringing under one secretary, one board in Richmond, organizing it kind of to better support communities kind of across the birth device spectrum regardless of the program, regardless of the building type, regardless of the funding source, and really figuring out how do we say a one-year-old is a one-year-old a one-year-old. Here's what we expect if you take public dollars in terms of health, safety, and quality. Here are the aligned supports to help your site leaders be effective, to support your teachers to be effective, and here's how we'll measure quality in a consistent way across programs. Whether you're in Clifton Forge or Covington, whether you're in Norfolk or Fairfax, wherever you are, we've got a clear vision for success and are supporting our communities to do that across the state. A part of doing that will be kind of, you know, beyond that sort of shared definition of success, is really figuring out how do we reposition Richmond to better support communities. It means taking a hard look at some of the regulations and sort of figuring out what do we care most about. I think you'll hear a lot in the next uh, presentation about these teacher-child interactions, how you measure and support those. But really thinking about, if we want that to be the priority, how do we organize everything around that, strip back the regulations that don't make sense, and focus in on teacher-child interactions across our infant, our toddler, our three and four-year-old classrooms. That's a big, that's a, you know, that'll be a sort of a big lift for some of our programs, is we've got to think about supporting our teachers. And with all of our work, I always try to kind of bring us back to that classroom level. What does it take to support that teacher or teachers to be effective, right? How do we let them know what we're looking for? We want warm and caring classrooms. We want well-organized days and routines. We want them to be appropriately behaving, you know, uh, managing behavior. And we want them to be supporting instruction, right, in an age-appropriate way. This is not about worksheets, right? You can imagine as you saw all those wiggly dancers and how sort of, even how sort of more engaged the kids got as they're moving. Sitting a four-year-old down at a desk and say, you know, fill out these six worksheets is the quickest way to both not get what you want, deal with a behavioral issue, and to have this kid be like, I don't even like school, right? And you sort of, at four, how could you not like school if it includes fun things like Popsicle and Baby Shark? Um, and, and so that they kind of are developing those skills that they need for kindergarten and beyond. 